Greg here and we're outside the Australian Embassy here in London and it's the celebration of Julian's birthday yeah. and uh, you were one of the original people, supporters of Julian back when he was in the Embassy and I, I'm just wondering what it was like back then. Yeah okay, we're, I was actually on these stairs in December 2010 when Julian was banged up in His Majesty's prison uh, Wandsworth and um, I also served 13 months in the United States prisons for disabling a B-52 bomber. So that's my entry point. I'm a former prisoner. I know the more visibility a prisoner has on the outside, the safer it is on the inside. And I had to like spend 24 hours thinking, do I want to associate myself with Julian? He's been accused of bullshit uh, sexual offences and with the limited credibility that I have. And I thought, this guy is so isolated and he's done such significant work and this sounds like bullshit, which it was. And um, so we gathered here, uh, Australian academics and musicians and activists, and we were evicted from Australia House um, and we did a bit of a gig here. And uh, Julian was incredibly isolated, and um, which makes you very vulnerable. And uh, so in 2012, I was recruited by Sarah Harrison, who got snowed in out of Hong Kong. And that shows you the bullshit The Guardian used to publish. So Julian, I'm on the dyslexic spectrum, but Julian's on the Asperger spectrum, and they weaponized his disability against him, presenting him as aloof and elitist. Now, that Snowden is not in chains today proves that Julian knows about solidarity. Because up to that point, he could say, look, I was like an activist radical when I was young, but I'm now a journalist and publisher. But when he, um, him and Sarah freed uh, Snowden, and got him, uh, they were going to Latin America, but the Yanks pulled uh, his passport when he got to Russia. He's basically saying, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, Julian knows a lot about solidarity and he risked his whole life's liberty on rescuing Snowden. And um, so I, was, I went to Julian's 41st birthday party and I was grilled by Ziggy, who ended up being an FBI informant. Uh, before Ziggy, what? Cordeson. Yeah, the Icelandic dude. When you what? say grill, you mean... Well, we arrived. My godson, Ben Griffin, had been previously in the British SAS in Iraq and in the Paris in the north of Ireland and Macedonia. Um, we went to that birthday party and uh, he's, that was 41. He's now 54. So he's been detained. Wait, are you talking about Iceland? You went to Iceland? No, we went to Julian's birthday party and I was grilled by Ziggy. He was doing security for Julian's birthday. And where? He was an FBI informant. So uh, tell me where this was. Uh, this is at Vaughan's house where Julian was living. Vaughan Smith, who's the Frontline Club founder. Yeah, and he's a former veteran. He was so shot you're talking about London. That was his 41st birthday. Yeah, he was shot a couple of times, Vaughan. And, and Ziggy was there. Ziggy, yeah, he, he did security. What the hell was Ziggy doing there? As soon as he got out of the car, Ziggy was doing security on him. But he was an FBI informant, okay? And uh, then we went in and uh, there were a lot of people there, Bianca Jagger and um, all sorts of people, Goldsmith and, uh, and you know, these celebs kind of eventually abandoned him. And then... Um, because? I don't know. Um, because he was being... Um, so, you know, the Guardian with the main culprit, they did a job on him. They did a very good job on him where people were afraid because of guilt by association to be associated with him, just like they were afraid to question the bullshit charges on the Guildford 4, the Birmingham 6 and Maguire 7. And ironically, Julian ended up with the same lawyer as the Birmingham 6, the Guildford 7 and Maguire 7. Uh, Gareth Pierce. Gareth Pierce, who's a really living, walking saint. And, um, and you know, Gareth is brilliant. And she spent three years with Martin Luther King as a journalist before she became a lawyer and she takes off every course in England and uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman, you know. And uh, so then Julian has appeared at every court appearance in England and he didn't appear in the airport, so he's never broken bail. I'm like myself, I've broken bail about six times and he got the maximum sentence for broken bail a year. And um, so originally uh, I was at his four, first court appearance on December 7th, 2010 at Horseberry Courts, but they moved him to Woolwich which is a courtroom designed for terrorist charges. They wanted to put him in the framework of terrorism, even though he's a journalist. And um, there were about seven of us there on his first appearance, and he was in an old wreck of a car, and he pulled up and shook all our hands. And he's not an elitist, you know? And uh, 
I said, I'm from Brisbane. He said, you've come a long way. But uh, then he realised who I was um, because he, he was active during the first Gulf War and he remembered uh, the disarmament of the B-52 bomber. So, um, Which you did time for, a hard time in New York? Uh, uh, no, well, I was arrested in New York, but I did most of my time in Texas where I was the only white guy in the jail and there were 24 of us in a cage and six cages brought together. And there were like 500 Mexicans and I was the only one who resembled a gringo. That really better odds at the Alamo, really. And uh, so I got bashed for about a month and then uh, people wrote to me in jail and I got popular with Mexican stamp collectors and then I, used to, I was pretty good at soccer or football and I ended up on the African team and that raised my credibility. People started leaving me alone and probably picking on other people. And, you're um, talking about while you were in the jail, right? Yeah, and then, I, and then I started writing, helping people write in English to their girlfriends and lawyers. And, uh, and, you know, and I'd go to Mass, I'm a Catholic anarchist pacifist, and I was the only uh, uh, gringo at Mass. And, um, and, yeah, so I survived nine months in Pecos. And, uh, For doing hundred... the right thing. Yeah, as, as a lot of people have done. Yeah. So, um, and then he got moved to the Ecuadorian Embassy, and I used to visit him in there with my godson, Ben Griffin, who I helped start Veterans of Peace UK. So they would let you in and you'd go in and talk to him with your godson? Yeah, yeah. And then Ben would train him in boxing. And Julian is not a natural pugilist, really. And, uh, but it was good for his mental health and physical health. And so I'd just uh, go and read while Ben was <laughs> And then I, then I was asked to live outside the Ecuadorian Embassy. And, uh, By who? Well, I came over because my friend had been tortured in Colombia and um, Australia was playing Colombia at Fulham in the warm-up for the World Cup in 2018. And uh, that's the day they turned the internet off and then I was asked to move into Knightsbridge uh, by WikiLeaks people. Australia was paying Colombia to follow you? No, Australia was playing football with Colombia at Fulham. Sorry. And uh, that's the day they turned the internet off and I was asked to move into Knightsbridge, which I did. And then I was asked and. November 2018 to move in 24-7 because at that you know, point the Colombian president had changed and that what had become a sanctuary for Julian became a trap and they were loading it up with new cameras and stuff. But who asked you, Kieran? Who asked you? Uh, WikiLeaks people. Okay. Yeah, so... They were the ones who asked you to have a presence there at the Ecuadorian embassy Yeah, because they were, they were banned from 5pm to 9am. So there was no one there overnight. So... Um, I, I lived there from late November till he was taken in April. And I You're think talking about 2018? 2018. When it was in the Ecuador Embassy. And then my mother's health was failing. So wait, when you're talking about late November till... 2018 till April 2019. Gotcha, so the final year that he's been there, yeah, the final so, months. So then uh, my mother's health was failing in Australia. My Australian passport was running out. I'm pretty much banned from Australia House. I organised an 18 hour trip to Dublin to get refresh my passport and uh, I think they had a police informant with me because I only told Julian and Julian's PA and this person and uh, he was taken seven hours after I went and um, so you know Special Branch had an apartment directly opposite uh, the Ecuadorian Embassy and they never engaged me and um, because I think they'd Why already think? engaged me with an informant uh, and um, so, so they were doing it stealth? Basically. Oh, yeah. They've got unlimited resources, really. And um, so then <coughs> we hired a truck and I moved my stuff out to Belmarsh Prison. And I lived on the traffic island there through 2019. And the Labour Party, Royal Borough of Greenwich Council, flattened my pace, took all my stuff. And then I returned again last year. So we'll talk about the scene that you created outside um, for Gaza, for example outside on the grounds where your tent was pitched outside Belmarsh yeah, so because that is that is amazing an amazing yeah. and profound um, piece of support. Yeah so while I was outside Belmarsh prison um, the Israeli state was starting to incinerate children in Gaza and I remember making a sign that said it appears that the only thing Israeli state learned from the Nazi experience was one uh, how to recreate the Warsaw Ghetto two ethnic cleansing and three the final solution. And, um, you know, instead of bringing uh, the children to the ovens, as the Nazis did, the Israeli state was bringing the ovens to the children, through American uh, planes and stuff, uh, British and American planes. 
And uh, like if they didn't have British and American weapons, they'd be throwing rocks at them, really. You know. Can you just tell us when you were spending time talking with Julian in those early days in the embassy? Do you think that he had any idea that it would take this long for him to to be free without any kind of restriction on him, a free man? Well, no one's free. I'm not. I'm not free. You're not free. But he's released, thank God. And um, I think Julian knew what they were going to do, and it's not over yet. They're going to chase him all his life, you know. Sure. So you think that it wasn't? It wouldn't have been a profound idea to him that it would take 14 years for him to walk out of Belmarsh and no, he, he, get back to Australia. He, you know, like the Pope, who was a Jesuit in Argentina when that when the. US uh, armed and funded Argentinian dictatorship with throwing nuns out of helicopters. The Pope and Julian know what the American Empire is like. They are brutal, you know. So we're and working on a pardon now for Julian, right? Do you want to talk about the idea of that? The movement yeah, yeah. is now shifting? Well, the good thing is what's happened is much better than winning an appeal at the High Court. For those that Laurie loves High Court appeal that he won, but he, if he goes to Ireland or France or Sweden or or Portugal, the Yanks can still lift him. Who are you talking about now, Julian? Laurie, Laurie Love. Laurie Love. And sure. uh, he, so he's still vulnerable to being lifted. Now, even if Julian had won at the High Court, he'd still be vulnerable in another country to be extradited to the United States. So this is a much better ending. So they dropped 16 charges, and I spent 13 months in the United States prisons, and I hardly met anyone who had a trial. Everyone plea bargained. They threatened with 50 years. That's what they do. Plead guilty to five, even if you haven't done it and people aren't going to take the risk of doing 50. And like, it's all horse trading, plea bargaining in the United States. And how do you feel today? I feel exhausted. So just <laughs> one I thing feel, real quick, I feel how very, did you... I feel very happy that he's had his first birthday outside of custody since 2010. Oh man, thanks Kieran, thanks for talking. Thank you.